Well, we'd like to say that this is a familiar face, but it's more of a familiar voice that we're going to be uh, hearing from today. Ken Connors from CJAD, CJAD Radio, and today he's going to be speaking about privilege and public service. Ken is the host of the weekend morning show on CJAD 800 and Saturday and Sunday mornings from 6 to 9. He's also the co-host of the station's long-running Sunday morning trivia show, which airs from 9 to noon. So for you trivia buffs, uh, <laughs> get up a little earlier and maybe we can get something going here. Uh, Ken began his broadcasting career in Northern Ontario in 1985, and he had stops in Guelph and Ottawa after that, before an offer in 1989 from Chome here in Montreal brought him back to Montreal. In this city, he's also hosted morning shows on Mix 96 and The Beat. A native Montrealer, he was born and raised in Saint Laurent, where he still lives with his wife, Lorena. And apparently she says that they're happily married, so she must be right. With that, Ken, uh, I will uh, pass the uh, baton over to you and uh, take it away. You've got about 20 or 25 minutes, and then I'm sure we're going to have some questions for you. All right. Um, can you hear me okay? Thank you, Jim. It's excellent. Thank you. All right. You read that very well. Are you busy this weekend? Can you pull a shift on the air? <laughs> <laughs> with, with my sultry baritone? Yes, we'll take it. Uh, thank you, Jim. Thank you, Sam, for the invitation. Um, where should I start? Well, you know, I think as a young boy, uh, I knew on some level that uh, I'd eventually wind up uh, with a career in radio. I'm the youngest of six kids. Uh, the television was my babysitter uh, many days as a young boy growing up. And um, I was exposed to, as the youngest of six, I was exposed to a lot of, uh, a lot of pop music uh, growing up, especially with three older sisters. Uh, and I loved listening to my tiny uh, transistor uh, pocket-sized uh, radio, which I still have, by the way, and still works. I took it with me uh, everywhere, um, everywhere I went. At night, I always had it, and I'm sure I'm not alone. I always had it tucked safely, secretly under my pillow to listen to Dick Irvin, called the Montreal Canadiens Games, and uh, Dave Van Horn uh, paint those beautiful pictures in my mind of uh, the Expos on the, on the ball field. Uh, they were both, they were both uh, masters at what they did. Uh, back to Dave Van Horn for a second, though. Um, one afternoon at Jerry Park, when I was a young boy, I had the chance to uh, not only chat with Dave Van Horn, I believe at, at some point, I used to listen to every game, and I think he said that uh, he would, an hour before game time, before the first pitch, he'd always go down to this little landing behind home plate at Jerry Park and meet with fans and talk to fans. And so I was so excited to, uh, to find that out. So one day, when I wasn't sitting in, in the bleachers and I had access to get behind home plate, um, I met him there and I brought along with me a school assignment or a project that uh, we were given, I think it was grade four, grade five, where you had to sort of uh, talk about or display, show and tell, I think, uh, what you wanted to do when you, uh, when you grew up for a living. And, um, and mine, of course, was uh, this bristle board, I guess, with text and pictures of uh one day i wanted to be a play-by-play -play baseball announcer and i showed it i brought it with me to the park <laughs> and i showed it to dave van horn uh, complete with his photo too uh on it and uh, he was very impressed with that he was very very nice and um uh, i guess that was an early sign where i was headed not to get off on a tangent but i guess i think it was yeah it was 2019 uh when we were marking the 50th anniversary of the Montreal Expo, 16, right? They started in 69. So it was the 50th anniversary of the Montreal Expo. And I had a chance to uh, talk to Dave Van Horn. I had him on my show. And I told him that story about me meeting him before the game and bringing him my school project to show him. And he was very nice about it. And uh, he uh, he congratulated me on, uh, I guess, on following through on that dream. During that chat I had with Dave Van Horn too, I, uh, I also told him that, um, thanks to the power, I guess, and the magic and the mystery of radio and that very personal one-on-one -on -one connection, which is really the basis for, for good radio, the foundation of radio, that one-on-one -on -one connection. I told him that for a while because I had listened to, all, I, listened, I don't think I missed an Expo game in the first five or six years of their existence, thanks to that transistor radio of mine. I took it everywhere. I told him that on some level, whether he realized it or not, he was my best friend, uh, for all those years. And I'm probably, I wasn't the only one who, who felt that way because he was so good. He was so good at connecting with the, the listener and just, you know, 
painting those pictures in your mind of what was happening uh, that he described so beautifully on the ball field. And um, anyways, when I told him that, he was my best friend. He was quite touched by that. And I was, uh, I was pleased that I got to tell him that all, the, all these years later. And that ability, you know, in, in that we have in radio uh, to connect with uh, someone one-on-one uh, -on -one is, I guess, something that the biggest reason drew me to this profession. Uh, I've never taken that for granted, that ability, that, that privilege. Uh, it's an honor, really, to, to sort of reach out to someone and, and inform them and entertain them, entertain them uh, keep them company, and just be there for them. I, I love that. Any radio announcer who's uh, been on the air for enough years uh, has dozens and dozens of, uh, of these stories, examples of, of how a small gesture, uh, just a mention for someone or something, can touch the listener and, and stay with them for years. It's it's always uh, wonderful and surprising uh, to hear uh, about these things, uh, sometimes many years later. I'll give you just a couple of examples of that. Uh, we had a listener called The Trivia Show maybe a couple of years ago. I don't know anymore. I've got pandemic brain. Everything is before pandemic. Called into The Trivia Show uh, after we had just played a little bit of an old Van Morrison song. We play, the, we play songs on The Trivia Show on Sunday mornings coming back from commercial break. And we don't play the whole song. We play a little bit and our listeners enjoy that. And it was an old Van Morrison song called Tupelo Honey, I think from the early 70s. And, uh, and a listener called in and, and to play along with one of the, the quizzes, but said to me, Ken, uh, I just want to mention before I, about that song, Tupelo Honey, 22 years ago, when I had my daughter at St. Mary's, we called from the hospital room and asked, we were listening to you on, I was on show at the time during the, the, the midday show, during the electric lunch hour. And she says, we asked you to play Tupelo Honey and dedicate it to my daughter. Because I think the line in the song is, she's as sweet as Tupelo Honey. She's as sweet as anything can be. And um and the fact that that woman called me, she said, my, my daughter's 22 years old this week. And she remember, she told us how they listened to it in the, my dedication to her in the hospital room with family members around and her husband around. And it was, it was a thrill for them. There were some other friends and family had heard it. And the fact that she, she took the time to call me back and let me know how, you know, that moment had stayed with her and was important to her and her family. Uh, I mean, it was, it was wonderful. And it's, it's uh, one of the uh, one of the gratifying things about uh, doing this job. I'll give you another one quickly too. Is that um, um, it was when the when I think they're still doing it. Um, the Jewish General is doing their weekend to end breast cancer. It was called that back that back then, where you'd walk for two days to raise money and awareness about breast cancer with the Jewish General Hospital. I did the walk for several years, but one year when I wasn't doing it, I was on the air on a Saturday morning. Uh, I got a phone call from someone uh, who was there with their family members and they were walking to honor their mom who they lost to breast cancer. And uh, I did a shout out to them on the air and they had heard it. And uh, they called back a couple of weeks later. She called back uh, to say uh, how much that meant to them. And she was so uh, happy that we could get that on the air. So the fact that I get to do that, it's just one of the many rewarding things about my job. Uh, I get to do this work uh, here in, in Montreal where I was born and raised. Uh, when I did get back home and started working here in Montreal, it was a thrill for my mom and my, uh, my siblings. And it's, uh, it's something I'm very proud of and I don't take for granted. I also wanted to talk a bit about uh, radio, especially local radio, and uh, how it continues to, to provide a, uh, a vital service, an important service and a vital service. On a news talk format, such as uh, uh, the one we have at CJAD 800, uh, the service is obvious, right? We have the, the latest news, the latest weather, the road reports every 15 or 20 minutes or whatever. Uh, and that's important. But the best example uh, of how important, how essential that public service is and can be it, uh, is, uh, is during these unprecedented, every now and then you have an unprecedented time or event. And of course, the, the best recent example is the pandemic. Um, there was so much information coming at us, uh, all of us, uh, whether you're in radio or not, uh, in those first couple of waves back in February, March of uh, 2020, um, uh, there were so many questions uh, that had to be answered. Local radio really was a lifeline for the community. Um, I mean, seven days a week around the clock. Uh, we weren't quite sure what we were dealing with back then, as we all know. Um, and people were looking for information. They were looking for answers, and and radio stepped up. On our station, it was 
it was all hands on all hands on deck uh, delivering the very latest uh, news uh, on the virus uh, information on the virus and then later on of course in the vaccines and how that was going to roll out uh, we had it in every newscast and as well and this was important too we not only brought in experts i mean doctors health officials government officials to 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 come on the various talk shows and and answer questions but but we we allowed thousands of listeners literally thousands to call in and ask these questions uh, and text in and and just not only ask questions but but to vent as well and you know uh it was it was a great outlet for very anxious and stressed people like you know hospital workers of course and uh, teachers and uh, restaurant owners and families uh, taking care of seniors and worried about them um it provided a, an important outlet and that's just another another reason why radio can be so vital uh, especially locally those first couple of ways we were in over our heads and uh, and radio was there for a lot of people you know the uh, oh and this too I wanted to mention too in terms of being a great public service during the pandemic I guess for uh, every Saturday and Sunday night for several months for a couple hours each Saturday night each Sunday night we had a local doctor I believe he's from Westmount or his clinic is in Westmount a clinical psychologist by the name of Sid Miller he was on the air for all those months just taking calls offering guidance offering counseling and just letting people call in and, and and get some help if they were stressed and anxious and you know we all were to a certain extent um, during those early uh, early months of the pandemic and of course when you're talking about a uh, public uh, a public service and and how important radio can be locally um you can't forget the 1998 ice storm i mean cjd it's uh, legendary in fact when we celebrated our 70th anniversary uh, a couple of years ago um the ice storm and looking back on it was a big part of um of how this uh that our radio station uh, and other stations as well really really stepped up to uh throw a lifeline to a lot of people who were in the dark and uh in uh in uh in a bad way for so many months for so many weeks i guess during the uh, ice storm of 1998 so you know i uh, i've always said if you're uh if you get to do uh what you love for a living and uh, and get paid for it and live comfortably um you know you're uh you're incredibly lucky and um radio can be a um, media in general can be a cruel someone mentioned lisa laflamme a couple of minutes ago uh it can be a a cruel business uh, at times but uh, at least where i'm concerned um the the good times far outweigh the bad times and uh, it's provided me great opportunities a wonderful career and uh, a lot of perks too like uh like the chance to talk to you people today here at the westmount rotary club thank you for having me I now open the floor to questions. I'll start. I've got the first question. Yes, sir. Name and occupation, please. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Jim. My name, yeah, my name is Jimmy Fairs, and I want to grow up to be. We haven't figured that one out yet. That's the problem. Uh, it must be nice. I'm, I'm sure you've been told this a thousand times. It must be nice to work nine hours a week. I believe it's three hours on Saturday, three hours on Sunday, and then another three hours on Sunday. And that's what most people think that radio hosts do. What goes on in the background? Where where, where are all your other hours being put in? Uh, up, Jim. Um, no. Um, you know what? A lot of people go, oh, my goodness, you work Saturday and Sunday. That's wonderful. But it's really, um, it's really a five-day-a-week job. Um, as far as my weekend show is concerned, uh, you know, I do about five or six interviews per weekend show, uh, per weekend, uh, usually three on Saturday, three on Sunday. I book those interviews. I don't have uh, what some of the other shows have, which is a booker, a talent booker, uh, not a talent booker, but a uh, book guest. Mm -hmm. And so I do that on my own. So that takes up a lot of time, you know, uh, when I usually take Monday off and not work and not think about work, but come Tuesday morning, I start thinking, okay, what, you know, start looking at the week ahead. The weekend ahead and what uh, who I'm going to have on and then you have to reach out to them and email them or text them and set up the interview and so a lot of work goes into goes into that a lot of work goes into the trivia show as well I uh, had a bad habit on uh, when I first started this uh, job on CJD a weekend show back in 2016 of leaving things to Saturday night and that was a huge mistake because I was getting bed too late and uh, so you you sort of have to plan and pace out the work uh, the workload so a lot of a lot of it starts on uh, on Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday as well, and really ramps up on Friday. Don't call me on Friday; I'm too busy. 
Thank you. Questions from the from the gallery here. My goodness, we've got an active bunch today. Um, because I, I can ask you, I can ask you questions all day. I would presume that you don't necessarily get recognized on the street right. by your face. Uh, but uh, it, would, do people recognize your voice if they're see if they're beside you on the street? Yeah, it, it happens. It happens quite often. If I'm, uh, it happened recently at a uh, a little uh, Italian delicatessen on Marcel Larin in uh, in Saint Laurent. I was talking to someone who knew me at the counter as I was waiting to pay, and then I'm a regular customer there. And uh, the uh, one of the managers behind the counter preparing my sandwich went, "Oh." that's who you are i thought the voice sounded familiar and so it was it was very sweet and so i get i get a lot of that um yeah, recognized by my voice if i'm if i'm talking loudly enough somewhere how does a radio station uh make the decision or rate uh, a voice then and, and make the decision that it's acceptable to be on air because there's a certain je ne sais quoi i think those days have kind of past where the voice you know your voice i mean it's it's it, i guess it's 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 a plus to have a a voice that sounds nice on the radio but uh, it's more of the content and uh, what the person offers in terms of pos, uh, you know their their personality and how they can speak coherently and uh, you know uh, i think far too, much, far too much emphasis is put on on someone's voice on the radio because uh, not, not all radio announcers have a great voice um uh but it's not really uh, an impediment to, to to being on the air just helps. Last chance for the rest of the crowd. We have a question from Sam. Yes, Sam, go ahead. Of course, I have a question, I have a question but uh, 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 probably most of you know, Ken has interviewed me a whole whack of times. So I'm gonna say, excluding me, um, what, are, what would you classify as your most perhaps memorable interview? Or maybe you've got several uh, people that you've, that you know, would really stand out uh, or something that happened during the course of the interview that made it memorable? And then uh, was there one that you can remember where it really crashed and burned or went someplace <laughs> you didn't really think it was going to go? Because I've certainly heard some of those, and uh, I've probably been a been a part of some of those too, who knows, uh, over the course of the years. I was going to say, aside from the last time we spoke on the air, Sam? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did it crash and burn? No, no, no. You're always so smooth and so prepared. You make me sound good when I'm when I'm talking to you on the air. Um, I've uh, I don't know how too many that have gone badly. Um, although if I think about it, uh, someone come to mind. Um, I've had the privilege of interviewing, uh, I guess, uh, three or four prime ministers over the course of my career, um, which is always fun. Um, um, I've interviewed a lot of celebrities and most of them, most of them are quite nice and uh, come to play. Um, um, I'm trying to think of interviews that have gone badly. Uh, a, a lot of times uh, they're, you're being rushed because uh, someone on the other end, uh, there's usually a, a, an agent or a manager on the, uh, on the line as well, telling them to hurry up because a lot of times uh, celebrities are doing, uh, are doing a, a group of interviews, uh, a bunch of interviews, uh, a blitz of interviews in one day. So you're allotted the eight or 10 minutes uh, time. And uh, the, minute, uh, the minute you hit that uh, time limit, someone will, someone will jump in on the line and say, wrap it up, wrap it up. And that could be annoying. And uh, that's the only time really an interview um, uh, can go bad um, when, you're, when you're pressed for time like that. Uh, on the air too, uh, you know, you wish you had a lot more time on the air because our radio, our interview segments uh, on the morning show, uh, we go, we tend to go a little longer on the weekends because it's a little more relaxed and there's a little more time. But uh, when I fill in for uh, Andrew um, during the week, uh, the radio, the interview segments are, are because it's a busy show and there's always uh, traffic and and weather to hit and use uh, headlines to hit you. Uh, there, we stick them to about five or six minutes. So you wish sometimes you wish you had more time, but you know. I have a question, Jim. Go yes. ahead, Dave. Do people listen to the radio more at home where there's a competition of television or in the car? Uh, I'm sure there's uh, stats for that. I'm, uh, I haven't really seen them, but I think, uh, you know, it's, it's split depending on your, what you're doing during the day. We have a lot of people who, uh, well, some people get up with CJD in the morning. So it's, you know, the clock radio's on or uh, they put it on their phone and then they're listening in the car on the way to work. And 
and some people, I guess, depending on their job, uh, listen uh, listen on their um, on their computers as well. But uh, I guess it's evenly split. A lot of people, we still, I mean, the radio, the the radio is always on here in our house in the kitchen. Uh, we, we tend to always have it on. In fact, sometimes I have it on in too many places, which drives my work crazy. I'll have it on uh, in the basement. I'll have it on in the office. I'll have it on in the kitchen and the radio in the bathroom's on just to keep track of what's going on. Especially during a time like the pandemic where you're just trying to, you know, stay on top of everything. Uh, uh, the radio was on almost 24-7. I believe uh, Susan Buscemi has a question next. Yes, Ken, thank you so much for speaking to the club today. Sure, um, this might put you on the spot, but has management ever vetoed uh, a proposed uh, guest that you wanted to interview? No, uh, that's you raise an interesting point because uh, people who uh, are, aren't pleased with the radio station and uh, are, will criticize the radio station um, will tend to think that a lot of uh, uh, there's a lot of control from up top about what can and can't be said. And uh, I've been at CJD for six years now, and uh, my my boss has never told me who I can and cannot talk to or what I can and cannot say. Um, it's 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 never come up. I think the only time um, it does come into play is during a, an election campaign where we have to be uh, we have to spread spread the wealth. You know, you, you can't just interview a liberal or conservative candidates. Everyone's got to get their fair share. So that's the only real time um, in my recollection where the you know they'll send emails around telling you you know make sure if you're going to have one on have 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 the other ones on as well. Um, no, I can't really say, uh, I've been vetoed on who, a lot of times it'll come up that, uh, the guest has already been on, uh, earlier in the week. And so they say, you know what, maybe, you know, and it's not really to tell you not to do it, just to remind you, you know, do you still want to have Sam on to talk about this because he was on two days ago, uh, with, uh, with another show, but, uh, that rarely happens. That rarely happens. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Deborah. Yes, um, I th I really appreciated your 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 um, comments about when you were a child going to the baseball games, and uh, uh, I, I I wondered did you ever uh, get involved on the radio doing anything with sports, and how did you get your start in radio? Um, by the way, I uh, I think to to get into the bleachers at Jerry Park was fifty cents or a dollar back in the day. That shows you how old I am. And uh, I used to take the one sixteen. I don't know if Sam uh, knows where the uh, the one sixteen or the sixteen bus. You would get it at the corner of DeCarry and um, and I think Delegles and Saint Laurent. It would take you right to Jerry Park. It's I remember it. I remember it. <laughs> we both grew up in Saint Laurent, by the way. So that's a that's little right. bit of uh, trivial history for Ken and Sam. About two streets over, too. Never ran into him. Um, um, no, I, I uh, do a little sports. I did a little sports uh, broadcasting on television, on global TV. I used to fill in on the global evening news and on the global morning show for a couple of years uh, for the regular sportscaster every now and then when you go on. And I didn't particularly like the morning show on television because a uh, you have to you have to shave, <laughs> and uh, they have. Uh, I mean, our radio hours are getting earlier and earlier. The uh, the weekday show now starts at five, and so you you have to be in the chair by four thirty. But in television, that's a, that's a hard schedule for those morning shows. I think they're in the building at four, uh, or even earlier, especially the people who need hair and makeup. But to answer my your other question about how I got my start in radio, um, I just completed uh, Van uh, Vanier. I did a couple of years at CJIP, but I knew even going into CJIP, I wanted to work in radio, and there really wasn't an outlet uh, or a path for me in Montreal. Um, I wasn't even sure if I was going to be any good at it, and uh, my wife, who's listening from another room right now, told me one day, because she was going to McGill at the time, I was working in retail after uh, after my two years in Vanier, and she said, uh, why don't you just uh, apply at the... Uh, McGill radio station and I looked into it and you had to be you had to be a student you had to go to McGill in order to work there at the radio station and so um I lied my way in I made up this whole profile of uh the program I was in uh, the courses I was taking the professors I had and just in case I was asked about it but I I uh, I walked into the radio station at McGill University one day and asked if I could have a show, and they gave me one every Tuesday night from six to eight. And so that's how I got my feet wet behind a microphone. And um, 
after about a year of doing that, a very nice gentleman who was on the air at Mix 96 or at FM 96 back in the day, his name is Richard Burl. I used to listen to him a lot doing the evening show on Mix 90, on um, FM 96. And I called him one night on the request line and asked, told him my story. I said, I have a little demo tape of my work at McGill. Could you listen to it and tell me if you think there's a potential there for me to pursue this as a career? And so the next night he invited me down to uh, the studios on Fort Street uh, when he got off at 11. And he took me into another studio, listened to the tape, and he said, yeah, I hear something there. I think you have something. You should uh, pursue that. And I did. And I um, I ended up going and spending uh, a bit of time at Humber College in Toronto, which had a radio program. and met a lot of wonderful people who were in my position trying to break into radio. And uh, after the program ended, I made uh, 24 demo tapes, about five minutes in length. Sent all 24 out to various stations in Ontario small stations, small market stations, Chatham and Peterborough and the like. And uh, I got one uh, one job offer in Kirkland Lake, Northern Ontario. And raise your hand if you know how far north that is. It's about 10 hours. Yeah, straight up, straight up 11. <laughs> and um, and I took it. And that was the summer of 1985, my first uh, They offered me the all-night show. And they offered me a salary of $11,300 a year. And it was wonderful. And uh, from there, I went to, I, I moved on down to Guelph. From uh, Guelph, uh, I was offered a job in Ottawa. And in Ottawa, I was offered a job in Montreal, and I came home. No, oh, that's wonderful. Thank you. Much, much to my, uh, my wife's uh, delight, because we, we had a long-distance relationship going at that time. And she didn't enjoy riding the Voyager bus up to Rouen <laughs> Aranda, and then having me pick her up there. <laughs> oh, the... the the uh, the price you pay for being famous. Got to pay your dues, Jim. I guess apparently, apparently, yeah. Overnight. Yeah. I'm sorry. Overnight fame. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Five years. Get to, uh, it was a five year plan to get back to Montreal, and so I made it back in four and a half. That's not so bad then. No. Would anybody else like to step up? We're good then. No how, questions how about. Do you Oh, I do. I, how do you come up with your trivia question? I love, love, love the trivia show. You know what? All the credit goes to, I, I take care of the first hour, which is the audio quiz. But uh, Dan Laxer, who's been doing that show, I think, uh, almost 20 years now. Um, and of course, did many, many of those years with Dave Fisher. Um, uh, Dan does the bulk of the, uh, of the writing of the questions. And uh, he's so good at it. He churns them out. And uh, he's taking two weeks off, uh, I think, in November. And uh, he's going to leave me to write all those questions. So I may have to start as soon as we finish this. <laughs> Any questions about anyone I work with? Who wants some gossip? How smart is Dino Mazzone? Dino is very smart. He's a very good guy. Um, um, yeah. Um, yeah, Dino's a great guy. He was, he was, on, he was calling him from Florida on uh, Sunday, this past Sunday. And uh, it's a great segment that he, he started doing with Dave Fisher, I think, almost almost 30 years ago. And um, I feel like Dino's uh, more than just a guest on my show because his uh, his brother and his uh, sister live a couple of streets away from me here. So I'm always seeing his, I think I see his siblings more than he does. Yeah, Dino's, Dino's a terrific guy. He just um, went through some personal health issues and came out uh, came out fine too. He talked about on the air. I'm not sharing anything that he didn't want to be talked about on the air. He had a bit of health care, but uh, he's good. he's fine now. Very Thanks. good. Thanks. Ken, uh, we're gonna uh, we're gonna let you go and have your lunch now. You said you'd had it earlier, but I didn't believe you. <laughs> but thank you very much for joining us today. You're uh, welcome. Yeah. So some of the reminiscences is is is, is kind of fun.